live from Palo Alto, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering I.O. Brought to you by I.O. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Silicon Valley on Sand Hill Road at the Rosewood for a special live CUBE presentation for IO Conversations with IO Data Systems. We're here talking about the future of the data center. Data center is a platform on, on our next guest, David Mettler, VP of Sales and Market uh, Development and Directing in the US. Welcome to the CUBE. Well, thank you very much. Glad Good to be to here. see you. So obviously, you know, you guys have a great history, obviously understanding the data center and the modular stuff that you guys have done. Mm -hmm. Huge innovation. Um, I remember talking with George Slack that's when the CEO years ago, when open compute was just a uh, twinkle in the eye of Facebook, and then now the momentum around that has been phenomenal. Right. These are the kind of trends that are seeing. How are you guys adjusting to this? What's the company's update? What's the value proposition today for you guys? Sure, no, that's a, it's a great question. I think IO brings a different proposition to the market because of the modular uh, data center aspect. We do the full range of traditional data center services. We have you know, your traditional raised floor, but the, uh, the modules allow us to provide um, in a standardized deployment, we can do high density, we can, um, we can provide an integrated solution with our software system, and it's, um, it's something where we can deploy services quickly and scale in a scalable fashion for our customers without doing sort of custom you know, builds each time we deploy. Uh, and it's also the same delivery of service all around the world. So at this point in time, we have four data centers in the US, and then we have Singapore and Asia, and London for Europe. Europe. And for our customers, it's a nice value proposition in that they know exactly what they're going to get in each location. It's the same presentation of service. And so where's the software in this? Because obviously as the mm -hmm. data center as a service becomes the mode of operation that they want, right. customers want, you have to have software to run it. So you know, we heard from, from the thought leaders earlier today about the intelligent smart data center. That's How right. do you make the data center smarter? Certainly standardizing is step one. Right. Where's the software angle on this? No, it's great. It's a great point. I mean, there's obviously been software in data centers for a long time. Right, but the I think the difference that we've done is really the integration of every layer of the, the data center from not just from like the the BMS system that's managing your 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 chillers and your mechanical and electrical, but also within within the actual between the PDUs, right? The whole looking at the data center being integrated with the IT stack and being able to provide information about from the chiller to the chip, right? So. Because businesses want to understand what's the impact to the application within the data center. If something fails in the data center, what's the business impact at the application level, right? And that's where the software becomes very interesting because it can provide that type of information. Also, the software is the, it's the foundation for being able to deploy data centers autonomously in the future. I mean, that's the vision down the road, right? Is to be able to actually operate and control the data center through the software layer. And so for us, that's the, um, that's the vision that we have and the software kind of forms that foundation. It allows our operating team to operate all of our facilities from sort of a single command center. We don't have disparate systems at different data centers that are, you know, different versions of software, different actual software manufacturers, and we're, you know, you've got you've got people on the at the facility who are the only ones who can really control it. It's all being able to, to be operated centrally because of this one system. Take a minute, and if you can, for the audience, mm -hmm. just define what is data center as a service? What does that mean? What's the definition? Sure. I mean, I think at the at the the most simplest level, it's the idea that you're buying co-location, right, as opposed to uh, as opposed to building your own data center and running it yourself. I mean, so it's really, it's the outsourcing of the data center and being able to procure space, power, cooling, security, um, and information about all of that on a monthly basis. Well, but let's, let's break that down a little bit. Sure. Um, so I have my own data center. Mm -hmm. I have the cloud. Right. Uh, a lot of companies today are saying, eh, not the data center, yeah, yeah, the cloud, I'll do the cloud for some parts. This is an opportunity to not have to invest in physical infrastructure associated with the data center, but yet still get some of the benefits of a data center. That's right. Right, so that you're not so much worrying about, say, uh, you're not so much worried about multi-tenancy. Mm -hmm. You're not worrying about having somebody else's links go down. Mm -hmm. We're not suggesting that some of the big cloud providers lose their infrastructure anytime. Sure. But you have at least a little bit more control for the workloads that you feel you need more control of. Right. Either from a performance predictability standpoint or uh, from a cost standpoint, not wanting to have, you know, only buy what you need or from a security standpoint. Mm -hmm. So 
Talk to us about the types of customers or the decision process that they go through when they think about doing something between on-premise, doing it themselves, and full-bore uh, uh, devotion to the cloud. Sure. You know, I mean, and that's that's what we deal with every day, right? And the the customers that are still managing their own IT on-premise, um, it you know, it ranges from very small startup companies who have decided that it's important for them to, to have their own IT as opposed to just starting in the cloud, right? Because that's what a lot of people do now is just, let's just start in the cloud, right? So, But there are companies that have started with their own IT and they look at it and as they've grown and as the closet that that IT sits in becomes more and more of a risk to the business, they say, well, you know what, we need to have redundant cooling we need to have redundant power this if we lose you know if we lose some some aspect of this environment our business is down right that's the very simple case to say this isn't what we do but it's critical that, it, that this is operating correctly so let's put this into a into a data center um, and then you have you know you have companies that have built out their own data centers and they've come to kind of that end of life period and they've, they're looking at it they're saying, boy, there's a ton of money for us. To, uh, it's a large capital expense to invest in the upgrades that we need to this facility. Is that the right use of our capital, right? Does that make sense right now for us to be, do, to be, us to be making those upgrades or does it make more sense to go with a, you know, a data center provider and do co-location um, and you know, procure data center as a service as opposed to a business unit that we have operating our own data centers with our own staff and, and so forth. So you're effectively helping people not have to invest in the energy elements or the, the energy infrastructure, uh, the cooling mm -hmm. and uh, environmental infrastructure and the facilities infrastructure necessary to run their own data center, Correct. but providing the benefits of controlling their own data center destiny if they want it. That's so correct. You get, you get the data center benefits, but you don't have to pay for the energy, facilities, and environmental infrastructure necessary to do it. That's right. You don't have to invest a large amounts of capital. You don't have to have the, the large, large fixed capital in that stuff. Correct, correct. In, in that non-IT, if you will, the, the things that have to run the data center. Right. So the Peter asset. talks all the time about the physics and the network comes into the play mm -hmm. here. So part of this data center service is a network component. Sure. And I want you to, to elaborate if you can, share some insight around a, a topic that's being talked about in that is the cloud is just a data center that no one knows where the address is or it's basically co-location in the cloud. Sure. There's still a data center needed, but the notion of moving the data and the compute around where the action is has mm -hmm. been a big, big data conversation. But software-defined networking has been growing significantly. Mm -hmm. Significantly. Absolutely. What's the impact to network performance from a cloud architecture standpoint when you start thinking about who to choose, as customers start thinking about who to choose? Because as, that's the big question. Mm -hmm. I want to have a facility partner right. that has great networking. Right. I mean, what are the current things going on there that you can elaborate on? Sure, no, I think that that's the question that most of the businesses we talk to today are trying to figure out, right? They're saying, well, there seems to be a lot of benefits of the cloud, right? The public cloud, other sort of more dedicated cloud service providers, the idea that we don't have to go out and procure our own IT stack and run and operate that ourselves. We can just drop our applications in, right? That's, that's attractive, but for a lot of companies, they don't know what that means for their legacy environments, how do I migrate this legacy, and what do I do with the legacy, right? So they're, they're sort of trying to figure all that out. Having the connectivity from the data center into that public cloud, it provides optionality, right? It gives them that flexibility. They can have certain workloads that go to the cloud. It's there when they want to start something new and integrate it into the existing environment. Also, they've a lot of businesses, they've invested heavily in their own IT staff. That IT staff is very important to their business. And the proposition of the cloud, a lot of times the, 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 the economics involve getting rid of your IT staff or re reducing that IT staff dramatically. And the impact of the business then becomes unknown, right? If these people leave, these people have helped build out a lot of the technology that underlines our business. If now they leave, what does that do, do to us? And so they're kind of- There's a personnel component. Absolutely. Too the personnel component, and that's very real, and companies are trying to figure that out. And so, for, from our perspective, we think it's very important to be able to offer a value proposition that says there's absolutely a place for co-location, there's a place for the public cloud, and there's a place for infrastructure as a service within the data center, so that would be our own dedicated cloud platform. So you can kind of provide those three levels of service, if you will, and the optionality where you don't have to make those decisions right now what everything's going to be, but you can grow into it over time. It's an interesting proposition, and we were just talking on our intro about some riffing on the idea of what is the notion of what does data center word mean. Right. And 
Pat Gelsinger said at VMworld that most companies, if not all, want to be out of the data center business. Mm -hmm. But we were talking about they're in the data center business. So you, they want to be out of the facilities business, right. per se, but they need to be in the data business. Mm -hmm. So where does this kind of fall down in the conversations that you're having with your customers, and where do they kind of weigh in on? What do they say? Yeah, no, I think I think that's I think that they're looking at it and they're saying we definitely do not want to be running chiller, you, you know, chillers, and we don't want to be um, retrofitting a facility to uh, to upgrade the power, right? We don't want to be doing these things, and these and 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 we want to get out of that. We want you to handle that. We don't want to have to worry about physical security, right? Those are the things that you guys do really well. And when they come and they tour a facility like ours, I mean, you guys have been to our facilities, right? You've seen them. They're, they don't. There's no way that they could achieve the type of technology and the scale and the the um, sort of the, the way that we operate. They couldn't do that themselves, and they look at that and they say, boy, wh why even try? Right? It doesn't make sense. How do you manage the fiscal security piece? Because that's mm -hmm. always going to be, it always is the fail point is usually a person, a human, right. a crack in the system. How do you guys handle that fiscal? I know that I've been there, so I know that you walk in, it's like going into the government building. It's really, I mean, there's some physical security, but how do you ensure that that doesn't uh, be a problem? Sure. Well, I, so there's, I think you're going to find in any any of the top data center services, they, they have the physical security is generally, you know, very strong, right? So you've got a perimeter fence, you have access control to get into the facility, you have your guards, right? You've got you've got the cameras and you have the um, the monitoring that's taking place. One of the things that differentiates us, and this is where the, the modular deployments become unique, is that there's a privacy element. If you come into our New Jersey data center, or, or Phoenix as an example, you'll see just rows and rows of these modular data centers that we've deployed for our clients, and you have no idea who's inside of them. Or you have no idea what's going on inside of them. We have, you know, we have customers who who are very, very um, protective of their IP. And the IP is actually the racks that they've designed and the way that they deploy within those racks. And so the idea that that's private, that can't be seen, is very important. Versus a cage, Correct. right? Versus a cage on a raised floor where you can, you know, even if you have like a black kind of, you know, see-through screen, like a windscreen on a tennis court, right? Do you have that? So there's layers of security in the building. That, that's well, there's, there's a couple things I'd say to add to that. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, since most security problems are created by people, you reduce the number of people. That's number one. That's right. Number two is you anonymize you anonymize the relationship between workloads and devices. Uh, number three, you have great physical security, and number four, uh, and you know I think this is going to become increasingly important. You start to deploy technologies that allow you to take advantage of, for example, uh, what's going on not with Bitcoin per se, but a lot of the new binary mapping technologies that we see on the horizon for doing some of this stuff. So you deploy new security, new technology that leads to better security. But at this point in time, there's one other really, really important point, and that is uh, the, there are the, the absolute best security people on the planet cost an enormous amount of money. And they can be hired and paid by some companies and not by most general run-of-the-mill IT organizations. So it's a combination. And they have a security investment that they can that's cover. That's right. Fewer people, uh, get the right people. Versus me, the enterprise, right, hiring physical. some guru that I have to vet, costs a huge amount of money, that's and absolutely. he can walk out the door and That's right, time. you run the that's risk right. of that individual that's leaving right. and your security and policy is. And he yeah. will. And so there's a. Uh, well, the vetting is, alone is a near risk. This yeah. Is a, yeah, this is this is a this is a major, and for many years of this being the reason to not go to the cloud, this has now become a reason to go to the cloud. So the cloud, in this case, is more secure. Yes. because of the right. multi-tenancy kind of models you're talking about. Well, there's there's also there's also compartmentalization when you when you have a a contained unit um, as opposed to a cage again, right? I'm yeah. kind of making that comparison between the, the modular deployments that we have versus sort of traditional raised floor. If there is an event in that module, it's contained to that module. It's not the the, the, the people right next door aren't impacted by that. Yeah. Versus, you know, yeah. you're not going to have the same. Well, great to have you stop by the cube and share the insight. What's going on in the field? Yeah. Obviously, um, the sales motions are. Ch always changing, but Absolutely. still, the cloud is an enabler for you guys, so that's congratulations and uh, and good luck with your business. Great, thank you very much. Pleasure okay, to be we here. are here live in Silicon Valley on Sand Hill Road for IO Conversations. If you go to Twitter, search on the hashtag IO Conversations, you'll see Bert Lattimore uh, documenting the CUBE interviews. Join the conversation, or just tweet us, ask any questions. We are here for the IO event. Data Center as a Service, this is the Cube. I'm John Furrier with Peter Burris. We'll be right back with more after the short break. John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media.